Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz vocalist and educator Sean Montiero. She just released a new 2021 CD called You Are There. It is her sixth release overall and third for Wailing City Sound. Overall, her artistry is crafted in the mold of Sarah Vaughan, Carmen McRae, and Nancy Wilson. Her father was the late renowned bassist and veteran of the great Duke Ellington Band. And she also got a lot of musical inspiration and guidance from her godfather, Clark Terry. And Latin percussion legend Mongo Santa Maria discovered her working in a club in San Jose, California, and signed her on the spot to tour with the band. Her stories are great. Enjoy this interview. Sean, thank you again for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz today. I appreciate it. No problem. I appreciate you playing the music. Absolutely. So... Your sixth release overall and third for Wailing City is You Are There. Talk to me a little bit about the timing of this. Uh, you know, it's coming well, out during during this pandemic and everything that's been going on. How does this feel, release feel for you? I wish it had been released just a little bit earlier, but it was. it's a long time in the making. I had recorded the first, well, the second half of the, the CD uh, three or four years ago in Brooklyn before COVID. We were playing around with, you know, which tunes we wanted to do. And that was with um, Penny Barron, Joe Farnsworth, John Allmark, Steve Davis, and Nat Reeves. And then when I got home, I kept thinking about the songs that I didn't do, that I wanted to do. So went back in the studio four years later and recorded the first half of the album with my band. And we put it together, and the result is that beautiful thing called You Are There. I, I'm very, very proud of this piece. What do you ultimately hope the listener gets from this experience? Getting to know who I am. I always pick music that um, means something to me. Lyrics mean something to me, and also melodies are very important. And I also like to do stuff that the listener maybe have they've heard it before by someone else, and they can get my take on it to, to see who I am and how I handle a song, and how I interpret a message, a story, because we are we are storytellers. I think I told you that before, we are storytellers. When I find a, a song that resonates with me, melody, chords, lyrics, all of that, then I grab it, and I have a list, and a, a huge list of songs that I want to do, and it just so happens that these are the ones I picked for this CD. Also, the You Are There song, um, I had found it a while back but I thought of my dad uh, every time I I played it because my dad was in a band with me I was lucky to have him play bass with me although my dad played his name was Jimmy Woody and he played with Duke Ellington and Miles Davis and Sarah Vaughn and Charlie Parker and you name it he did so I was very blessed to have him on stage with me every night and he was sorely missed for me when when he passed away so you are there is about him so it's safe to say that jazz and music has just always been in your blood with your father being so ingrained in the jazz world. Always. It's always been in my blood. The first song that I ever learned was Lullaby of Birdland by Sarah Vaughn, and I was under the age of 10, and I knew the scat. I, I knew that song backwards and forwards, and I still sing that song today after all these years. So was there any other dreams, or did you know that you were going to be a singer? I used to play a lot of Broadway music, my, you know, because my parents bought a lot of showboat and all that, and I knew every single song. But when you think about jazz and, you know, as you get older and you realize the songs, most of the songs come from the Broadway stage. You look at all those things that Frank sings or Sarah sang or Ella sang, they, the majority of that music was from the Broadway stage, written by the great people like, you know, Cole Porter and Gershwin. And you you get further on, and then you have lyrics by Alan and Marilyn Bergman and, and um, Jimmy Van Heusen and uh, Johnny Mandel, one of my favorite writers, you know. So it's it's always been there in me because I knew those tunes so young. And I did venture off into different bands, into a, a, a R&B band, into a blues band. But my love, I kept coming back to jazz, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. So before we really depart this current state of what we're living through, what did you realize <laughs> about yourself during this pandemic lockdown? Maybe that you didn't realize before that's going to make you stronger as you promote this album and get back to the stage. Well, it, it made me realize how much I miss performing. I, I love performing, and not necessarily in, in a big uh, arena, like a big, big jazz festival. They're great to do, but 
they're 20 and 30 feet away from you with a fence and security all around it. I like to work in very intimate rooms. You know, I would call intimate like the Blue Note or here in Boston Scholars where I can make eye contact with my audience because I, I try to tell them my story and I know they get it. You can see it in their eyes. And it, it means so much to me. And, and everyone that comes to see me, they always remark that, oh, I felt like you were singing just to me. And I said, believe me, I was. <laughs> so um, I missed singing very much. I taught on Zoom for a year because I was teaching at uh, the Jackie McLean Institute of Jazz, the Hart School, and Javon Jackson is a chair there. But I did not like teaching on Zoom because I need to be a hands-on. I need to be with that student. I stopped that. I had been there for 14 years, but they let me travel to Europe, which I did quite extensively. So now it made me realize how much I miss Europe, how much I miss performing, and just how much I miss, you know, jazz. I just miss it, interacting with bands and friends. It's a camaraderie and it's a family that you lose except for over the Internet. And streaming, for me, just doesn't work. Yeah. You know, when I, when I read through your jazz bio, there's so many charming moments that <laughs> weave together your jazz bio. And one thing that's, that's wonderful, and I want to know what you, your recollection of this, mm-hmm. Mongo San, Santa Maria signed you on the spot in San Jose when he saw you perform. What was yeah. that like? Well, I, I was singing with this band, and I was singing standards, and it was late at night at this little club called Pepper Tree Inn in San Jose. And I worked steady. When I started working, I worked six nights a week, only I wasn't like big time. I was trying to make a mark for myself. And Mongo's crowd came in after his concert, came into the club I was at. And I kept looking over there, wondering who all those people were. And then finally someone came over and said, Mr. Santa Maria would like to speak with you. Well, Mongo didn't speak any English, so it was basically through a uh, translator. But he said that he loved uh, my singing. At the time, I was playing congas and, you know, a lot of percussion because I was always a drummer. I was in a drum and bugle before. And he said, I like the way you play, so I'd like you to join my band, and I'm going to leave a ticket to you tomorrow. This was in California to fly to New York on a Friday morning. And so I got that ticket. I flew to New York. They picked me up at LaGuardia. We went to St. Nicholas Auditorium. We rehearsed this wonderful horn player, by the name of Marty Shallow, who now does a lot of arrangements because he lost his lip. He did my arrangements. And then the next day, Saturday, I was in Miami at the Fontainebleau opening with Mongo for Stan Kenton. So that happened in the space of like 48 hours. Wow. It was on up, you know? You know, of all of the people that I've ever heard about, stories or anything in the world of jazz, there's one person, probably a handful, but in specific, more specifically, one person that I've never heard one thing negative said about him and that would probably be one of the best representations of this art form, and he happened to be your godfather. Talk to me about Clark Terry. Clark Terry, he was one of a kind. He was an amazing, I'm going to get chucked up here. He was um, an amazing man, and he taught me how to teach because he knew I had the knowledge but we started traveling together to to universities. I I sing with him, and and I started getting master classes with all of the knowledge that I got through Clark. He was a great teacher, and he surrounded himself with young people all the time because he had so much to give. But then he would go play with the Golden Man Jazz, which would be like my dad and James Moody and Kenny Drew and Lionel Hampton and all this stuff. But he was always back home. I spent a lot of time with him. When he lived on the East Coast, he lived in a, a city called Glen Cove, and I used to drive my car to Orient Point, Point take the ferry over, and spend one uh, weekend, month with him. And we'd sit out on the on the uh, porch, and it was like a glass in thing, looking at the water, and talk for days about music, the theory of music, how to sing it, how not to sing it, how to how to perform, how to present yourself. And then, of course, he told me a lot of funny stories about my dad and him back in the day with, you know, the Ellington Band and when he left for the Basie Band. And all. it was just, I learned so much from him. And uh, luckily for me, I was with him all the way up until the end of his life. So it was a wonderful thing. He was just a giving person, and all he wanted to do was surround himself with young people and teach them what he knew. That wield of influence is going to reverberate for so long. There's been so many people from Justin Coughlin. There's a local cat, um, Trent Austin, that's talked glowingly about him. I mean, it's, 
unbelievable to to even wrap your mind around how many young musicians will attach yeah. to his power. Yeah, because he he treated them all like they were his kids, you know, and they would walk out that door after a lesson or spending time with Clark and be walking about 10 feet off the ground because he did not talk down to you. He He talked to you almost as if you were equal, but every word he said, was a teachable moment. Everything that he said was a teachable phrase or a teachable moment. So you have really had to, not that you had to pay attention, you wanted to pay attention because of the way he presented everything. You know, as if Clark Terry and your father weren't enough of an influence and legends in their own right to give you knowledge of this craft and how to perform. You've been around a lot of people like Ray Brown, Lionel Hampton, Hank Jones, Jimmy Cobb. It goes on and on. My, yeah. my question to you is this. What have you learned from the legends and luminaries that you, in turn, are teaching young musicians that you get around? Oh, so much. Number one, no ego. There's no ego in music. Those people, you know, Johnny Griffin, you know, all these great people, they have no ego. They they play, they just get up on the stage and play, and they will take your breath away the way they play, but they're just another guy, another cat, whereas the young people a little bit full of themselves. And Clark used to tell them all the time, don't get too full of yourself because nobody else will appreciate you. But these older, these older players, you know, and I played with them a lot through the years, um, they would give me, me lessons on what to do, what not to do. They'd compliment me when they thought I, I was doing great, but they didn't hesitate either to suggest, maybe you want to do this instead of this. And so I got so much knowledge from them and but the main thing I I learned was not to walk on the stage with an ego. Walk on the stage with confidence, but not like you're the baddest you know chick in town or the baddest dude in town because there's twenty thousand more behind you that can sing better than you or play better than you. We just happen to be the lucky ones who are getting airplay or whatever. Every day you wake up, you have the chance to perform and live this life of a jazz musician singer. What's the <laughs> yeah. greatest part of being a professional musician for you? Being on stage performing, that's the most, that's the, that's the, the easiest part. The hard part is getting there. Like, say you have a gig next week, you have a tour in Europe, you gotta be in lines, and this was before COVID. After 9-11, it was absolute hell traveling. You had to be in lines, they didn't put the TSA line in until much later. You know, be fresh. You have all of this stuff. You have music. You have, if you're going to be there for four weeks, my, <laughs> my agent saw me when I can't, got off the plane like in Naples or in Rome. He'd start screaming, oh, shut. I said, listen, man, I'm going to be here for four weeks. i got to change my clothes at night. I can't wear the same thing. People come see me. So traveling is hard. You know, getting up early in the morning after you've, you know, got to your hotel room at 3 a.m. and they say, lobby call, 6 o'clock. you got to be there to get to the next place. Um, I think the hardest one I did was um, maybe a year before COVID. I had 29 one-nighters in a row. And the last night that I sang, it was the last night I could sing because I don't think I could get another note out of my mouth. But um, it's so worth it when you get on stage and, and the people, you see their eyes and you see their smiles. and you see, It's almost like you see a light bulb above their head and it, it goes on. It means that they get it and they get you. That's the most, you know, promising thing. People think it's glamorous. That other part of it, the traveling, trying to get ready, lugging music, sound checks, writing charts, that's the hard part. If you have a dream tonight, you run into your younger self around the time that you were becoming a professional musician, you were going out and, and beginning your gigs, and you could give your younger self a piece of advice. And this isn't a regret question. This is yeah. the wisdom you've gained over the years. What would you tell your younger self? You know, I you know, I wouldn't tell my younger self much different than what I did through my life. I would tell myself to write more. But other than that, I, I got a break so young and and was fortunate to, to work with the greats right out the gate, you know, all my life that I wouldn't do anything different. I'm happy where I'm at. I'm happy with the music that I do. I'm happy with the musical friends that I have that I can see and greet. I'm sad that some of them, you know, a lot of them are gone, but you get at that age when you start losing pe people. But I would not change anything at all, I don't think. So everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, your mm -hmm. students, but ultimately you live your life and you have a right. perception of you. Who do you think right. you are? Uh, well, I have many hats. I am a performer. I'm a mom. 
I'm a housewife. I'm a wife. I am a grandmother. I am a, a, an activist for things in my community. Um, I'm a teacher. It just goes on and on. Many, many hats. Many hats at any given point of the day. Beautiful. Sean, thank you for opening up the Neon Jazz. Good luck with the album and the return of the stage. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate you calling. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in San Jose, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Sean for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Never let me go. Neon Jazz.